A Daily Telegraph, please. Ta. Cost, stun me. Wars. Crime. Disease. Ugly power mad rulers. Dreadful new weapons and nasty tortures for kids. Like exams and broccoli. Isn't the news horrible? Well, I've got good news for you. It's always been like that. If you think today's Daily Telegraph is full of horrible news, you should have seen last week's, last year's, last centuries. I'm Terry Deary, and I've collected the disgusting parts of the past into my books, Horrible Histories. And they're all about how horrible life used to be. Wars, disease, crazed kings, even nastier vegetables, and most horrible of all, people. You wouldn't believe that people in the past could be just as horrible as people in today's news. But you'd better believe it, because these stories are true history. Horrible histories with me, Terry Deary. News has never been so nasty. 1914. Paper, Governor. Daily Telegraph, please. Ta. What a year. Stone me. A play by a writer called George Bernard Shaw shocks London. A character says the word bloody. <gasps> a lot of people are saying that over the next four years as the Great War with Germany starts. Very bloody. It was a war where people were blasted by bombs and bullets, where they were gassed till they were blinded and choked, where they were marched through mud till their feet rotted or frozen till their fingers dropped off. In 1914, newspapers reported, a cheer after cheer from the crowds greeted the news that the mother country, Britain, had declared war against Germany. Four years later, in 1918, They'll be cheering that it's all over. Hooray! But let's start in October 1914. <laughs> Jolly joining up. October 1914. Millions rush to join the armies. They're afraid it'll be all over before Christmas and before they can fight. It will be over before Christmas, 1918. The Germans and the French have been squabbling since, oh, 1871. That's when the Germans beat the French in a war. But by 1914, the British agreed to help the French if Germany ever attacked them again. Then came the newspaper headlines of the 4th of August, 1914. Read all about it! Read all about it! Britain has declared war on Germany. Read all about it! And the people of Britain read the news, which was mixed with a lot of lies. Imagine a young man in 1914. 1914? I remember reading that paper. I turned to the girl that lived next door. I said, here, you'll see. Look at what a newspaper says. Have you seen it? I mean, what the enemy did when they marched through Belgium. They reckon they caught some British nurses and carved them up. Then they burned down the hospital with the nurses still inside. They weren't even dead, I mean. Well, they were after that. And look at page seven. Look, it says, As for the Belgian babies, the enemy soldiers threw them up in the air, caught them on their bayonets, you know what a bayonet is, Elsie? It's a long knife they fasten to the end of their rifle. Anyway, they caught the babies on the bayonets, that's right. And then they roasted the babies over for campfires. What did they do that for, Elsie? Daft question. So they could eat them. True as I'm standing here. Ah, and another thing. If they capture one of our lads, they pull out his eyes. And they need lots of fat to make their explosives. So, you know what they use? Human corpses. So they melt them down and use the fat to make bullets and grinds the bones to feed their pigs. That's why we have to fight them. 
And that's why I'm going to join the army. Yes, Elsie, your Oris is going to be a hero. Of course, all the stories were lies. The enemy were just ordinary people like you and me. But the point is, we believed those daft stories. So, a couple of months later, we was all keen to go and join up the fight. Even the lads like me and Tommy, who were just 14. I turned to Tommy and I said, Here, Tommy, they're signing up new soldiers down the church hall. they give you a shilling if you're in the army. In a few weeks, you'll be fighting the enemy. Of course, Tommy said you had to be 18 to join the army, and I was just 16. They, they were recruiting down in the old church hall. I marched straight down there. An old sergeant sat behind the desk. I said, excuse me, sir. He said, yes, sonny. What can I do for you? I said, I want to join the army. How old are you, son? 19, sir. You're not really 19, are you, son? No, sir. 16. He said, tell you what, sir. Go for a walk around the block. By the time you come back, you may be 19. You what? Oh, oh, I see. Right. So I went for a walk around the block and then back into the church hall. The sergeant says, Yes, sonny, what can I do for you? I want to join the army. How old are you, son? And 19, sir. You're not really 19, are you, son? Yes, I am. He said, in that case, sign here, son. Here's your shilling. Welcome to the army. And that's how I joined the British army at the age of 16. And that sort of story must have been true, because there were a lot of 16-year-old soldiers who managed to talk their way in. The saddest case was Private John Condon of the Royal Irish Regiment, he died in battle on the 24th of May, 1915. The youngest British soldier to die in the war. He was just 14 years old. Cool Christmas. Thousands of British soldiers said goodbye to loved ones and sailed across the English Channel to fight the Germans in France and Belgium. They were in a hurry to go. Everyone was saying it would be a short war. It started in August 1914, but once the Brits got there, it would be over by Christmas. When Christmas 1914 came, the war was far from over. It was just the first of four miserable wartime Christmases. Four years of miserable channel crossings, followed by even more miserable days spent waiting or fighting. Yet there was one story from Christmas Day 1914 that has never been forgotten. An old soldier may have remembered it like this. They called me Eddie. I'd been in the army just a few months when the war started. December 1914 was the first Christmas I'd ever spent away from home. They said this war would be over by Christmas. They said a million men have rushed to join the British army and they were all worried that the war would finish before they got there. seemed like you never got away from the sound of war, even in your dreams. I were a bit miserable, but the lads were good, especially my mate Jimmy. He cheered me up. When I said I wanted it a bit warmer, he said, Warmer? You don't want it any warmer, son. The cold freezes the ground nice and hard and keeps us dry in the trenches. If it wasn't for the cold, we'd be over our ankles in mud. And you've got your chocolate and your tobacco and your Christmas card from the king and queen, haven't you? I said to him, Jim, it's quiet, isn't it? He said, it's Christmas. It's like an unofficial truce. We won't bother, Jerry. And he won't bother us. So, 
just enjoy your Christmas. I looked at the Christmas card from the King and Queen. It said, May God protect you and bring you home safe. And I was just going to say how quiet it was again. And the Germans were singing Christmas carols. We heard the music from the Hun trenches. Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht. In the still evening air, about a hundred candles were flickering on a dozen fir trees that stuck up in front of their trenches. Then I called, eh, Merry Christmas, Fritz! And a German called back, Merry Christmas, Tommy! We meet! We shake hands! You don't shoot, we don't shoot! Come here, Tommy! Shake hands! You don't shoot, we don't shoot! Well, Jimmy tried to stop me, but a lot of the lads had left the cold trenches and met the Germans in no man's land where it were even colder. I looked over the top of the trench and saw a group of about 20 Germans climb out with a football. They kicked it over the uneven ground. Then someone suggested a game. Well, I were a good footballer and I got picked as right winger. For an hour, there were no war. But there were plenty of conflict. Every time I ran forward, I were tripped by this stocky, red-faced German. After one tackle, I was sure my ankle were broken. Oh, only me heavy army boot saved me. The German booted the ball up the field, where a tall officer glanced it with his head and into the goal that was made by rifles stuck in the hard earth. There were just five minutes to go, and we were one nil down. Then I got the ball, and I ran towards their goal. I saw the big German charge it towards me. He skidded over the frozen mud on a slide that would have broken my ankle. I jumped up over his legs and ran on. The goalkeeper dived too soon. I waited and I slid the ball between the goalposts. <laughs> the British soldiers cheered till their throats were raw and I've never felt so happy in my life. Then the whistle went for full time and I were mobbed by my team. When I turned round, the stocky red-faced German was standing there. Suddenly, he stuck out a fat arm. Shake hand, Englishman. Good played. <laughs> Good played, Fritz, I grinned. Not Fritz, Hans. My name, Hans. Oh, my name, Edward. Good played, Hans. Good played, Edward. Good shoot, Hans said. Thanks, I replied, and I felt myself blushing. Well, yes, football, eh? Ja, ist gut, football. Today, shoot football. Tomorrow, shoot guns. When I looked up, Hans was marching back towards his trench. Hans! The German stopped and turned. Uh, good luck, I said. I recited the king and queen's words from my memory as if they were some magic charm. Uh, may God protect you and bring you home safe. Hans gave a brief nod. You too, Edward. You too. Having to kill someone you like, that's the most Horrible history of all. Christmas Crack Shots. Boxing Day, 1914. And the latest industry meant Brits in their homes were no longer safe in a foreign war. The Great War was the first war to see aircraft used. At first they'd fly over enemy armies to photograph their positions or to bomb them. Then the defenders sent fighters to shoot down these spy planes. War in the air had begun, as the newspapers reported. 
The Londoners had hopes of a quiet Christmas crushed when two German planes flew up the Thames yesterday. Crowds gathered in the streets to watch as two gallant pilots from our Royal Flying Corps chased the intruders at speeds of up to 70 miles an hour. Our reporter spoke to a resident of Chiswick. I could hear the gunfire quite clearly. What if one of those bullets had landed on me innocent dead? Hey! 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 The aircraft observers had fired rifles at one another, a common sight in the skies over France these days. No one was hurt, and the horrid Huns hurried back to Germany with their tails between their legs. But the use of guns is a deadly development of war in the air. In the early days of the war, observers would carry a supply of bricks and try to drop one onto the enemy. Londoners have been ordered to dim their lights this evening in case the unwanted visitors return. It's been reported that the Germans have invented steel darts to be dropped from their aircraft. If these strike a man, they will split him in half from head to toe. It just makes the people of Britain all the more determined to win. I'm sending my son Bobby down to the recruiting office today. And the story of enemy aircraft dropping brick bombs and deadly darts were true. Nineteen fifteen. This is the year when Britain and France become locked in the trenches on the Western Front while the war spreads around the world. For the first time, women are put to work doing men's jobs in the factories, making ammunition for soldiers to shoot at the Germans. Production more than doubles. The Germans sink the Lusitania, a ship sailing from America. Women, children and friends of US President Woodrow Wilson are killed. No one will be safe in this war. A vicar complains that the working classes spend too much time and money at cinemas. Uh, cinemas are probably a more serious menace to the nation than even drink. <laughs> what would he have said about television? So what were those trenches like? They were deep channels dug into the ground. The soldiers of each side lived in trenches and faced the enemy trenches across an area known as No Man's Land. That makes it sound cosy and peaceful, doesn't it? The truth is pretty nasty. But you'll never understand how those people suffered unless you read their own true memories of trenches and No Man's Land. Bodies and bits of bodies and clots of blood and green metallic looking slime made by the explosive gases that were floating on the surface of the water. Our men lived there and died there within a few yards of the enemy. They crouched below the sandbags and burrowed into the sides of the trenches. Lice crawled over them in swarms. If they dug to get deeper cover, their shovels went into the softness of dead bodies who'd been their friends. Scraps of flesh, booted legs, blackened hands, eyeless heads came falling over them when the enemy fired shells at their position. And that's the truth, because it was written by a soldier who was there. Cheerful chaps. How on earth did the soldiers survive that sort of trench horror? They survived by trying to cheer themselves up. Of course, there were the jolly songs to keep their spirits up. One of the most popular said you should just take your troubles and stuff them in your army bag, your kit bag. As long as you had a box of Lucifer matches to light your cigarettes, you could keep smiling. That song is still popular with Cub Scouts today. Can you imagine the cute cubs singing about having a cheerful fag? Huh. The song goes... Private Perks is a funny little codger with a smile, a funny smile. Five feet none, he's an artful little dodger with a smile, a funny smile. 
flush or broke, he laugh his little joke. He can't be suppressed. All the other fellas have to grin when he gets it off his chest. Ho! Pack up your troubles in your old kid bag and smile, smile, smile. While you've a Lucifer to light your fag, smile, boys, that's the style. What's the use of worrying? It never was worthwhile. So, pack up your troubles in your old kid bag and smile, smile, smile. Come on, lads, all together now. Pack up your troubles in your old kid bag and smile, smile, smile. While you've a Lucifer to light your fag. Smile, boys, that's the style. What's the use of worrying? It never was worthwhile. So, pack up your troubles in your old kid bag and smile, smile, smile. Yeah! What's the use of worrying? Good question. The soldiers in the trenches had a notice passed around. It was meant to make fun of a proper army notice that went up, and it went like this. Don't worry. When you are a soldier, you can be in one of two places, a dangerous place or a safe place. If you are in a safe place, don't worry. If you are in a dangerous place, you can be one of two things, one is wounded and the other is not. If you are not wounded, don't worry. If you are wounded, it is dangerous or slight. If it is slight, don't worry. If it is dangerous, then one of two things can happen. You'll die or you'll recover. If you recover, don't worry. If you die, you can't worry. In these circumstances, a soldier never worries. Cheating Charlie. In 1915, the British Army was having a terrible time in the war. They were bogged down in mud in France and dying in the dust of the Dardanelles in Turkey. There was just one bright spot for the British soldier, the camp cinema, where he could watch silent films. And in 1915, a brilliant new film comedian appeared to make the soldiers laugh their lice-infected socks off. <laughs> Charlie Chaplin. Of course, Charlie Chaplin was British. Were the British people proud of their clever Trump making it big in Hollywood? Were they? Ah, uh, well, um, to tell the truth, not everyone was. The press reported with disgust that he should have been in uniform, fighting for his country and having his funny little bowler hat shredded by shrapnel. The ordinary soldiers weren't so worried. Why would they want another clown in France when they had the British generals? <laughs> The soldiers just shrugged, took Charlie Chaplin's song and changed the words. As they marched along, they sang. As they brewed their tea or cleaned their rifles or cleaned out the toilets, they sang this. How oh, the moon shines bright on Charlie Chaplin. His shoes are cracking for want of blacking. And his little baggy trousers, they'll need mending before we send him to the Dardanelles. <laughs> Charlie Chaplin made a film called Soldier Arms that made fun of the Germans. It made people feel better about the war, at least while they were watching it. And after that, he was forgiven for not fighting. The Dead Poet's Footsteps One of the most famous victims of the war was the poet Rupert Brooke. He'd written a poem about the glory of war. And this was a dumb thing to do since he'd never seen the horror of it. But the people back in Britain wanted to believe it. If I should die, think only this of me. 
that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. Rupert used to live in Grantchester Vicarage near Cambridge, and he wrote another famous poem about that. The poem is called The Old Vicarage, Grantchester. No prizes for guessing why. He was sent off to fight in Gallipoli in Turkey, but he never made it. In April 1915, he was bitten on the lip by an insect and died of blood poisoning. It must have been a dirty insect that forgot to clean its biting teeth. This was probably not the glorious end Rupert imagined. The corner of a foreign field that is forever England is an olive grove on the Greek island of Skyros, by the way. When the war was over, a doctor called Copeland moved into Rupert's old rooms in Grantchester Vicarage. He tells the story of a frosty evening when he sat reading by the fire with his bulldog at his feet. Suddenly, the dog woke up and growled at the window. In the silence that followed, I heard slow, regular footsteps coming round the house and heading for the window. I threw open the window and there was no one there. Dr Copeland's landlord explained that the footsteps had been heard ever since Rupert Brooke had been killed four years earlier. His front and feet must have been hurting a bit by 1919. The explanation? Well, the dog heard burglars. Or Rupert didn't like being stuck in some corner of a foreign field and wanted to come home. Or... The owners of Grantchester Vicarage wanted to believe that their famous lodger still remembered them. But isn't it strange that only the famous Rupert Brooke came back to Grantchester and not some ordinary Joe Blog? Or maybe it isn't Rupert's ghost after all. Maybe it is Joe Blog's ghost. Huh? No, this is not as silly as it sounds. In Grantchester Churchyard, there's a memorial for the local men who died in the Great War. There are usually flowers at the foot of the memorial, put there by poetry lovers who remember the famous Rupert. Is that fair? What about the other brave men who died? Are they forgotten, and do they return to haunt the vicarage in revenge? Go there. Look carefully at the memorial and you'll see half a dozen other names on there. And one of the other forgotten names is Joseph Blogg. Honest. In 1916, men were conscripted to fight for Britain. That means they were forced to fight whether they wanted to or not. The army was getting short of men, and no wonder, because 1916 was the Battle of the Somme. 19,000 men were dead after one day, and after four months, 420,000 had been wounded, captured or killed. And at the end of the battle... The British had moved forward just two miles. That's a cost of about two men for every centimetre. Back home, some people had no idea what war was really like. For example, Sir George Sitwell. He had a real problem coping with the idea of war. World War I was fought largely in muddy trenches with the two sides trying to blast each other to pieces with shells. But Sir George wrote to advise his son Osbert... Directly you hear the first shell duck into the cellar and stay there quietly until all the firing has stopped. Even then, the bombardment is a strain upon the nerves. The best cure for that is to keep warm and have plenty of plain, nourishing food at regular intervals and, of course, plenty of west. 
I find a nap in the afternoon most helpful, and I advise you to try it whenever possible. Sir George hadn't a clue what war at the front line was really like. The real tragedy was that the generals, like Brit Commander Haig, hadn't a clue either. It's a pity George and the generals couldn't have read a poem that a front-line sergeant major wrote. You stand in a trench of vile stinking mud, and the bitter cold wind freezes your blood. Then the guns open up, and the flames light the sky, and as you watch, rats go scuttling by. The men in the dugouts are quiet for a time, trying to sleep midst the stench and the slime. The moon is just showing from over the hill, and the dead on the wire hang silent and still. A sniper's bullet wings close to your head, and you wistfully think of a comfortable bed. But now, a dirty blanket has to suffice, and more often than not, it's crawling with lice. Haig and his mob keep well in the rear, living in luxury, safe in old Centimere. Flashing red tabs, brass and ribbons galore. What the hell do they know about fighting a war? Not all of the poems were bitter. Let me give you an example of one that was a bit sentimental, almost soppy. See, those soldiers had their own ways of dealing with rats, of course. One was to take a pet dog into the trenches to catch them. And they grew fond of their little dogs, and one wrote a poem about his. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, here's a poem what I wrote about my terrier dog, Jim. The poem is called, um, Jim. A tough little rough little beggar, and merry the eyes on him. But no German or Turk can do dirtier work with an enemy rat than Jim. And when the light's done and night's failing, and the shadows are darkling and dim, in my coat you will nuzzle your pink little muzzle and growl in your dreams, little Jim. The Spirit of the Somme Soldiers in hospital enjoyed swapping stories about their experiences, but some of these stories were strange and mysterious. Well, with 19,000 dead in a day, it's surprising there weren't 19,000 ghosts wandering around. But there were some. Here's a tale told by one soldier on the Somme. We had a captain into Battle of the Somme. A tall, handsome bloke and a fine leader. One day, some chaps got themselves trapped in a shell hole. He found them and led them to safety. They was terrified. But he said, don't be frightened, men. Whenever you get yourself into a tight corner, I'll be there to pull you out. And he was there for us, time and again. But he did it once too often. He got himself killed, helping some chaps under some. We cried for him like a brother. I took over as platoon commander and I got our lads into a right fix at Albert. We was doomed. Then I turned round and I seized the captain with his bright eyes and his cheerful smile. He said, well Willis, it's been a close shave this time, but I think we'll pull it off if you follow me. So I leads the men the way the captain shows me and blow me. No sooner are we safe than he disappears. What do you make of that? A ghost story? Or is there an explanation? Here are three. First, soldiers would be bored in hospital. They could well get into a competition to tell the most exciting story. And if their true stories weren't exciting enough, they could make one up. After all, 
it's hard to prove the storyteller was lying. Or, maybe our storyteller was led to safety by an officer who looked like the dead officer. When the storyteller lost sight of the captain, he believed he'd seen a ghost. Or, a ghostly captain went on protecting his men even after he died. He became their guardian angel. Nineteen seventeen. The USA enters the war uh, on the British side, while the Russians have a revolution and massacre their royal family. And that makes the British royal family a bit nervous. Oh, blimey. Poor Brits have to eat war bread made from very poor flour. It's a delicious shade of grey. It tastes like, um, very faintly of socks, if you're lucky. Otherwise, it tastes of nothing. Which is precisely what British General Haig has learned from the Somme disaster of last year. Nothing. He sends still more troops to a muddy death in Flanders while saying, The enemy will collapse at any moment. How wrong can one man be? To many British soldiers, Haig was their enemy. Haig and another enemy so small you could hardly see him. The louse. Louses, I mean lice. They attacked soldiers in the trenches like a plague. One soldier said, I swear that as I dropped me socks on the floor, I saw them start to move. They were a seething mass of lice. One soldier wrote a poem about them. The Little Soldiers of the Night. Though some hundreds you may kill, still you'll find there's hundreds still for they hide beneath each other and are smart at taking cover. Then you have an awful bite. They've a shocking appetite. There are families in dozens, uncles, mothers, sisters, cousins, and they have their married quarters where they rear their sons and daughters and they take a lot of catching, cause an awful lot of scratching. The German soldiers had a way of dealing with lice. They heated a tin lid over a candle till it was red hot. Then they picked the lice off their clothes and dropped them onto the lid to sizzle. You can just imagine the German soldiers enjoying them. Hey, any fun fancies some sweet and sour fried lice? <laughs> it was a lousy life for a louse or a rat. One soldier described how they got rid of rats. If rats have been at your bread, then place the ruined loaves on the floor of your dugout. Find yourself a spade and torches. Switch out the lights. When you hear the rats swarming over the bread, then switch on the torches and smash the rats to a pulp. Another soldier said there was an even deadlier rat killer. We used to be overrun with rats in the trenches, but we could usually catch them with a little bit of cheese. We stuck it on the end of our rifle, and when the rat came to nibble on the cheese... <laughs> Result? Another dead rat. Batty bat slinging. If you were a British soldier in the Great War, you would soon learn a new language, army slang. In fact, there were two languages to learn, one used by the officers and one by the ordinary soldiers. Could you learn to sling the bat, that's speak in the local language, with the soldiers or with the officers? A common soldier speaking to a posh officer could almost be speaking a different language. I'd love a bon baby's head followed by a dog and maggot washed down with gunfire for afters or they've posy on Japan. I think what he's saying is I'd love some nice meat pudding followed by bread and cheese washed down with a cup of strong tea 
for afters he'd have jam on bread. Uh, now, stout fellow, uh, this Pip Emma, we need some eye wash before the doolally devil dodger comes back to check our flea bags. Oh, oh, I think um, what he means is, uh, now, my good man, this afternoon at PM, we need some tidying up before the mad army chaplain comes to inspect our sleeping bags. <laughs> oh, Sir, so, uh, I got a blighty one when a toffee up on an egg and a flying pig landed on me glory hole. Oh, you mean you received a wound that will get you sent home when a mortar bomb, a mine and another mortar bomb landed on your dugout. Well, I'm itchy cool from these chats in my teddy bear and I wish I was back in Mufti. Is that so? Oh, you mean use itching from all the lice in your shaggy fur coat and you wishes you was back in your normal street clothes. Of course that's what I mean. I do wish you chaps would learn to speak plain English. The Brutal British Field Almanac It's all very well saying pack up your troubles in your old kit bag, but if you got injured, you weren't likely to get a doctor to tend your wounds. Imagine what it must have been like to be fixed up by the sergeant. And he didn't have any medical kit in his old kit bag. He only had this book to teach him first aid. It's called The British Field Almanac. Here is some of the cheerful advice. Uh, right, men, sick parade. Uh, the doctor can't make it today, but you have me with the British Field Almanac to help you. What was that? No talking while you're injured and wounded. Uh, now, who have we here? The private George who's broken his leg. Broken leg. Uh, let me look in the British Field Almanac. Uh, uh, here we are. Uh, gently put the broken limbs straight after cutting off the clothes. Then fix it in this position by means of a splint made from a rifle, a roll of newspapers or pieces of wood. A roll of newspaper. In the middle of a battle? Where will I find a newspaper as tough as a piece of wood? <laughs> Maybe the Daily Telegraph pole. <laughs> As if the mud and cold and hospitals weren't bad enough, the army started using poison gas on each other in 1915. It blinded you, then it choked you. <coughs> At first, there weren't enough gas masks to go round, so the good old British Field Almanac told you what to do. Oh, right, lads, there's a shell just landed. The, the, the gas is blowing this way. Somebody's taken the only gas mask. In that case, uh, let's see what the British Field Almanac has to say. Oh, here we are. If you are caught in a gas attack without a gas helmet, then one, take out your handkerchief. Uh, two, uh, urinate into the material till it is soaked. And three, tie it round your mouth and nose and breathe through it. Well, get on with it then. What's the matter, son? You just had a pee. You've got none left. You can't go with all these people looking at you. Could you go somewhere private where you can turn the tap on because that helps a bit? Oh, give it here, son. <clears throat> Well, there you go, son. Don't say I'll never do nothing for you. <laughs> the 
Barbarian Barbed Wire. Well, if you survive the British Field Almanac and the gas and the enemy bullets and you ploughed through the mud, you came to the enemy barbed wire. You couldn't win. You couldn't climb over it, so you tried to go through the gaps. Well, all the enemy had to do was point his guns at the gaps and you were torn apart with bullets. The barbed wire was an enemy, make no mistake. So, what was the British soldier's biggest enemy? In those days, an ordinary soldier, a private, had no doubts. Like when you go to school, the biggest enemies are the teachers. When you're in a war, your biggest enemies are your own officers. The ones that send you off to face the bullets while they stayed behind. They even sang a song about them. If you want to find the sergeant, I know where he is, I know where he is, I know where he is. If you want to find the sergeant, I know where he is, he's drinking up the private's rum. I saw him, I saw him, drinking up the private's rum. I saw him, drinking up the private's rum. If you want to find the general, I know where he is, I know where he is, I know where he is. If you want to find the general, I know where he is, he's pinning another medal on his chest. I saw him, I saw him, he's pinning another medal on his chest. I saw him pinning another medal on his chest. If you want to find the private, I know where he is. I know where he is, I know where he is. If you want to find the private, I know where he is. He's hanging on the old barbed wire. I saw him, I saw him, hanging on the old barbed wire. I saw him, hanging on the old barbed wire. The Montrose Ghost In October 1917, a ghost was seen at Montrose Aerodrome. One witness said, It glided up to the door of the old Aerodrome barroom and then vanished. It was seen several times afterwards by many officers, they were sure it was the ghost of Lieutenant Desmond Arthur who'd been killed in a flying accident. Why was Air Ace Arthur haunting the site of the crash? Well, an official inquiry had blamed the accident on Desmond Arthur himself. They said, he was killed by his own foolishness. Yet the other officers knew that Lieutenant Arthur was a good pilot. They believed that his spirit was tortured by the insulting inquiry. Arthur's friends believed the ghost would not rest until his name was cleared by a second inquiry. When the second inquiry decided, we blame the fatal accident on a badly repaired machine. The ghost paid one final visit to the barroom in January 1917 and then was never seen again. A ghost story? Or is there an explanation? Maybe this is what happened. Desmond Arthur's friends were angry that he was blamed for his own death. They started the rumours of the ghost to attract the attention of the newspapers. The fascinated public then demanded to know the truth and a second inquiry was ordered. Or another explanation? The ghost seemed to spend a lot of time in the bar room. Did the spirits they poured in their glasses make the officers see spirits walk through the door? Simple Spymen Some places were haunted long before the Great War. But the war brought those places new horrors and new ghosts. Take the ancient Tower of London, for example. Full of phantoms from the far long ago. But the war to end all wars brought it back into use in a horribly historical way, as you'll find out from this true story. Have you any last requests? 
the Major asked the young man in the shabby black suit. I have, good sir. I would like to play my violin one last time, before you shoot me. The Major nodded and opened a hatch in the steel door and called to the guard outside. Bring Herr Bushman's violin from the office. He turned back to the prisoner. You are honoured, young Fernando. You'll be the first person to be executed in the Tower of London for hundreds of years. The young man gave a faint smile. It is a great honour to die for Germany, he said. It would be better to live, the Major pointed out, and pulled a wooden chair to the side of the bed and sat facing the German. My wife and child will suffer back in Germany. I regret being caught, but I do not regret spying for my country, he said calmly. The Major shook his head sadly. It was Germany that sent you here to die. No, they sent me here to spy. Oh, but they prepared you so badly. We were bound to catch you, the Major groaned. Don't you see that? No, the prisoner frowned. The officer leaned forward and lowered his voice. You will die at dawn. So there's nothing to lose by telling you this, Fernando. But they trained you in the spy school at Rotterdam. The head of the spy school is Herr Flores. Perhaps? Oh, we know it is, the Major sighed. And he sent you here with a passport written in his own handwriting. We recognised it at once. For the first time, a small frown of uncertainty crossed the young German's face. The Major went on, He sent you to an hotel in the Strand, where he sends all of his secret agents. He gave you a cover story. You were to say you were a salesman of cheese, bananas, safety razors and potatoes. But you know hardly anything about those things. The spy lowered his head a little in an admission of defeat. I sent in the reports the best I could, he muttered. You sent in reports that said we switch on London searchlights at 8pm and then switch them off again at 10.30 if no zeppelins appear, the officer said. That's no great secret to die for. You know what messages I sent? Of course. You sent the messages in code to a schoolmaster in Germany. That schoolmaster is a British spy. You were an amateur, Fernando. We will shoot you. But it's your spy masters who sent you to your death. There was a rap on the door, and a guard handed a violin to the Major, who passed it across to Fernando Bushman. For the next three hours, the sweet mournful tones echoed round the ancient walls and stirred the ghosts of long-dead prisoners. Slowly, the sky lightened through the barred window, and hobnailed footsteps clattered in the corridor outside. The prisoner played one last melody, but now the notes were wavering and disconnected. The German said, The music tells the story of a broken-hearted clown. <laughs> Maybe that's all I was, Major. He raised the violin to his lips and kissed it. Goodbye. I shall not want you any more. He laid his precious instrument on the hard bed, straightened his back and faced the men who waited at the door. I am ready, he said. Fernando Bushman faced an eight-man firing squad on the morning of the 19th of October 1915. He refused a blindfold, saying he wanted to die like a gentleman. He was one of 11 bungling amateur German spies to die in the tower during the Great War. On the 13th of November 1997, the papers connected with the case were sold in London. The saddest was the letter from his wife that read, Dear Mr Garrett, I would be grateful if you could send me the details of my husband's last moments. Was he at least allowed to keep his violin till the last hours? 
had he much to suffer? Will I find his tomb in London to weep at? My only wish is to visit and to sleep where my beloved husband is sleeping. There are many ways to die and many wasted lives in the Great War. Fernando Bushman's was just another one. Nineteen eighteen. The Great War goes on for eleven more months. In February 1918, with nearly a year left before the end of the war to end all wars, the Allies and the Central Powers have been battering at one another's doors for over three years and both are exhausted. The Germans have decided to have one last huge attack before they starve to death. It's like charging with a battering ram at a rotten door. The Allies give way and are pushed back and back and back. The Germans seem to be winners. But the Germans are rushing forward too quickly. Their supplies can't keep up with them and they soon run out. When the Allies stop and turn, the Germans have nothing left to give. The Allies push on and on and on, all the way to Germany. As the soldiers said, it's a long road that has no turning. It's never too late to mend. The darkest hour is before the dawn. And even this war must end. They began to dream of the end. They even changed the words of a hymn to sing about it. When this lousy war is over, oh, how happy I will be. When I get me civvy clothes on, no more soldiering for me. No more church parades on Sunday, no more putting in for leave. I will kiss the Sergeant Major, how I'll miss him, how I'll grieve. In 1918, Germany was losing the war. They were being starved into defeat. One German soldier explained, there were about 20 men. They walked like living plaster statues. Their faces stared at us like those of shrunken mummies, and their eyes seemed so huge one saw nothing but eyes. Those eyes, which had not seen sleep for four days and nights, showed the vision of death. Was this a dream of glory that I had when I volunteered to fight? Another German summed up World War I. Lice, rats, barbed wire, fleas, shells, bombs, underground caves, corpses, blood, liquor, mice, cats, filth, bullets, fire, steel. That is what the war is. It's the work of the devil. The British were not much better off. Private Stanley Woodburn wrote his will on a postcard and carried it in his pocket. He wrote it as a poem. My belongings are leave to me next of kin. My purse is empty, there's nothing in. My uniform rifle, my pack and kit are leave to the poor devil they will fit. But if this war I manage to clear, I'll keep it myself for a souvenir. Private Woodburn was killed in France in April 1918, when the war was almost over. The starved and feeble Germans were the losers. The war had lasted four years. 767,000 Britons lost their lives. Britain and her allies won the war. British children won the honour of staying at school till they were 14. Lucky kids. Teachers had their wages doubled. Luckier teachers. And I wonder... How many sergeant majors actually did get kissed? A 
after the war. The surviving men came home and expected to be treated like heroes. They weren't. They weren't even sure of getting a job after four years of fighting for their country. Many were bitter. They felt they'd been let down. And this bitter mood is shown in the sort of recital they listened to in the music halls as entertainment. When H. M. Burnaby recited this poem, there must have been a lot of men in the audience who were nodding in agreement and muttering, That's just what happened to me. It's the story of a simple accountant who went proudly off to war. Jimmy Johnson He was Mr. Jimmy Johnson, and he earned a weekly wage, and his life was as eventful as a squirrel in a cage. He possessed a wife and kiddies, living somewhere Brixton way, and he drew his humble pittance weekly every Saturday. And that was why he added rows of figures, nice and neat. He was Mr. Jimmy Johnson. Life was sweet. Then somewhere a bugle sounded, and he kissed his pen goodbye. His stool he kicked from under him. No time to wonder why. He embraced his wife and kiddies, and he told them not to pine. He was private, Jimmy Johnson, number 12129. He didn't quite appreciate the stuff he'd got to eat, but he was Private Johnson. Life was sweet. Now he's Mr. Jimmy Johnson, and he's got an empty sleeve, and he's smiling very bravely, and it's so hard to believe he's forgotten by the stay-at-homes who not so long ago said they didn't want to lose him, but they thought he ought to go. You can see them all around you. Some sell matches in the street. There are many Jimmy Johnsons. Is life sweet? One soldier described his search for work in 1919. I walked around and eventually sat on a park bench. I must have dozed off because it was dark when I woke up. I decided to stay there until the morning and I woke as the sun was rising, and what a sight met my eyes. All the benches were full of old soldiers in all sorts of old clothes, mostly khaki, and others were lying on steps. Some were wrapped in newspapers. These were the men who'd fought in the trenches, now unwanted and left to starve, all huddled together. This was in a country where Prime Minister Lloyd George promised that at the end of the war the men who came back would come back to a land fit for heroes to live in. Some land, some life. 1919. Just when you thought it was a safe world to live in, Spanish flu strikes. The war killed 8.5 million around the world. Spanish flu kills 20 million in just two years. Oh, and a new sweet is invented to celebrate peace. The Jelly Baby. Mm. A bit odd, this. The message seems to be, think peaceful thoughts as you eat a baby. Ah. But the most haunting song from the First World War wasn't Pack Up Your Troubles or even Hanging on the Old Barbed Wire. It was a little song that sums up just how pointless it could all be. All the death and the misery for, um... Well, the song says it all. Join in. You'll soon pick it up. We're here because we're here because we're here because we're here. We're here because... We're here because we're here because we're here. Horror. 
Terrible Histories was written and read by me, Terry Deary, and produced by Mick Baker of Testbed Productions. Original music was by Dan Fromaggio, and all the Horrible History books are published by Scholastic Children's Books. Meh. <laughs>